How are y'all doing today? Good to see you. I, the first thing I've noticed about uh, the COVID era is uh, in, in this forum is that if you guys are smiling, I can't tell it. And if you're frowning, I can't tell it. So it's like a win-win or a lose-lose. I'm not sure which one. But before I forget also, I want you to know that um, if you have any questions anytime, for me, I, you very much can raise your hand. And I'll try to repeat the question after you ask me. Um, we also have a microphone up here. So if you, uh, if you want to come up and ask there, but certainly during the talk, you can do that. Um, I want you to do that. I, I kind of envision that. Uh, this first talk in particular, I'm kind of laying the groundwork. So I do have kind of quite a few slides, but I may go quickly through them somewhat. I've got some film clips I do want to show. Uh, I, I may spread those out a bit, um, but I kind of want to go through a bit of a backstory, a little bit, a, a little bit of a backstory on me that I'll try to go quick on. And then a backstory on film in general um, as well. Since I decided to teach the class and, and WSU uh, contracted me to teach the class, I went back and not only reread, but I rewatched several of these films again that we're going to see and talk about. We're going to see clips of and talk about them. And uh, it was exciting to kind of hear them and see them again and think about them again. The reason also I'm spending some time today on some of this foundational stuff is because the silent era kind of gets completely overlooked. And while I don't want to belabor it for a long period of time, um, I want to at least talk about it, at least address it. So um, so a little bit about my journey. Some of you guys know me. I know some of you all. I recognize some of you all, even through your mask. And um, I have two degrees from Wichita State. They're both in history. I'm a history professor at Friends, if you didn't know that. And I've been a teacher for about 25 years. Um, my original degree was secondary ed social studies, so I've spent about half of my 25 years or so in middle school and high school teaching, and man, as difficult it is, as it is at the university level, you can imagine what it's like right now at the middle school and high school level. It's very challenging for, for all those teachers. I still consider myself one of them um, in many ways. In fact, I got asked to teach a class at the high school level about two weeks ago. Not sure why, but it kind of came out of the blue. I said no. Um, but it's gonna be such a challenge for those guys. But my background was academic and journalistic writing. I worked for the Wichita Eagle from 1992 to 1999, worked in the sports department. I covered uh, primarily basketball and baseball. Uh, those were my two kind of favorite sports. I had a pretty good run in baseball, so it kind of got me a job. I got that job before I had a degree. Academic and journalistic writing is so different than film script work and script work, and they're all just so unique in their own way. I always tell people that while I was finishing my master's at Wichita State, Dr. Miner, who was my mentor, uh, he taught, of course, taught me to use big words and explain things well and all those type things, which is sometimes difficult to read. Um, and one of my first assignments at the Wichita Eagle covering a sports game, uh, one of the editors immediately told me back or sent me a, in those days it would have been different than today, not an email, but he sent me a message and he just basically said, Stop using words that most people don't know. <laughs> and I thought, wow, that's different than uh, what I'm being told at school. So you've got to keep that in mind. And our big picture is history in film. I'm going to get to that a lot the next three weeks. So how do you take historical stories, real facts, and make them into a film? Because you're going to have to really pare it down. You're going to have to really squeeze and you're gonna to have to figure out what the big turning points, the hook points and things like that are. And that's a challenge. And, I, and I've often told the story of going with a, a fellow historian to see Tombstone, which maybe, well, I know later I'll tell you a little bit about that movie. Um, and when we watched the movie, he got, I thought it was great. I, I was there for entertainment because I may be a, 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 an academic, but I'm, I wanna be entertained. I, I think all of us do. And how we get entertained is unique. But anyway, we got up and I was thinking, man, that was a great movie. They really brought Wyatt Earp to me and Doc Holliday in a way I'd never seen before. And my buddy got up and he said, well, that's it. I'm either going to watch movies or read books, but I can't do both. Because he was aggravated because they had some things just wrong. 
And so that's the dilemma that's in front of any filmmaker who's trying to do history or any historian who's dreaming of making their story into a film. Um, and the other kind of prelim story, just a prelude story to kind of interest you, hopefully, is that when I finally did film work myself, I was working with an actor named Buck Taylor, and, and uh, I'll try not to overuse his name, but Buck told me that one time he was in a movie in the late 80s, which we'll get to that era and talk about how films were made then. And um, he said that he was in a movie, it was one of these TV movies about the Alamo. And in the movie, in the script, he was the one guy that rode away, that got out before it all went down. And uh, the day before they shot his getaway scene, his ride out scene, the director came over to him and said, um, okay, Buck, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have you run from, get off your horse, run hard, and then you're gonna die right over here by this stone wall, right over here. And Buck said, uh, excuse me, sir, uh, the script, I live. He's telling this to the director, you know. And the director said, yeah, you know, we've changed our mind, Buck. And listen, don't ever let a little history get in the way of a good film. And I've always thought that's that's a pretty good summary of, <laughs> of everything we're going to talk about is that that's the dilemma that you're always in. So, again, here's a little backstory on. So I finished my degrees and how I got into film, which was an accident, although I always loved film and I don't consider myself any kind of a pro. Um, I'm not saying that I will never try to say that I've just been around a little bit. But I had been a Civil War reenactor and in the 90s, uh, mid 90s there, really while I, was, while I was working on one of my degrees, I got an opportunity to be a stunt, to do some stunt work the first time. And not like high end stunt work, but some stunt work and it was pretty exciting. And it's kind of a thankless job for people who don't mind getting injured. Uh, in my brain, it, con it connected to my sports life. It really did. I thought I'll, I'll jump off stuff, I'll fall and I'll come off a horse. Um, so that's what got me into kind of watching film be done. And of course, in the 90s, you saw documentaries kind of rise with Ken Burns as the Civil War and many others. Ken Burns kind of came to his, his height during the 90s. And so that was when I kind of got interested and, um, and, and got to do what some people called in those days close-up extra work where you might get paid. You know, a lot of those bigger movies, they'll employ like 20 people to stay around that never deliver a line. You see that in almost every movie. Um, and that's what got me on the films, these film sets. And again, I'm not, a I don't consider myself at this point, anything like a filmmaker. Um, but I'm seeing how films are made. Uh, I will tell you one story and I didn't get on the Gettysburg set. I got, I got, uh, contacted to be on the Gettysburg set. I should have been on the Gettysburg set. I wasn't in, I think that was shot in 93, but then in 1998 or so, I was uh, cast to be in a movie called Andersonville. And again, this was as a stunt guy, mostly. But fun story, they changed filming about three times. Most of us have jobs. And so I kept trying to change my vacation to be there for the two weeks that I was to be there. So anyway, I finally pulled that off. And then for those of you who have ever, who have ever seen me away from this point, uh, I'm not real big. But the story about Andersonville is about a prison. It's about a Civil War prison. And they were looking for very thin people, needless to say. And uh, so I got my little thing that, you know, make sure before you report that you are. And I think at the time it was the height was 5'10 or 5'11, below 5'10 or 5'11 and under 160 pounds. Well, I was about 175 or 180 and I, I wrote the guy back and I said, well, I'm being honest. Uh, my driver's license says I'm six foot. My kids used to say I was 5'12". Um, and then I weighed about 175. Anyway, they said, okay, stand down. So they stood me down. Three months later, I got another letter that said, we've changed it. If you're under six foot and under 180, you can come. <laughs> and I thought, well, yeah, you had a hard time finding that many skinny reenactors is what you did. And so you had to call upon me. So anyway... Um, that was that story. And then Gods and Generals is the one I actually got to be in quite a bit. Uh, not that anybody could see me, but I got to be on set quite a bit. And that was exciting because uh, it was a big movie and um, Robert Duvall was in it, which is my hero and one of my heroes and Jeff Daniels and, and all that. So I got to meet some of those people, but um, I happened to be there on 9-11. I was there. We were shooting in Stanton, Virginia on September 11th, 2001. And the only reason I want to tell you that story is it, it was after that that story in that episode, and I won't do the 9-11 thing, 
but I'll just tell you, of course, for like a lot of us, what a shock. And I was on a set without any kind of phone or anything else, had no TV around me, didn't see any of the things that everybody saw for about 48 hours. But when I left there and came home back to Kansas, that's when I really decided I wanted to make a film, uh, a documentary. I thought documentary at that time. So um, this is a, 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 a picture. You weren't supposed to have a camera. You're not supposed to have cameras on set, uh, but that is a picture that I snapped. Uh, that's Jeff Daniels in the top hat there and the director, Ron Maxwell, in his Cubs hat. And uh, that's just where we were at. But anyway, that, and that happens to be on 9-11. On, on September 10th, we were shooting at VMI. And uh, yeah, of course, the whole world changed on after September 11th. Everything changed. They changed the filming schedule. Lots of things happened. But I came home intent that I would try to make a film. And uh, I'm not going to tell you about, talk about my films. I'm just going to say I made some. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to tell you about the last one a little bit, just because it kind of gets us back to our story a little bit. Um, by the time I'd done four or five documentaries and a couple of docudramas, uh, I, I was able to have some success and win some awards and things like that. And then this was our pictures from my last film, which is called Home on the Range. Uh, I've written a couple scripts since then, but they haven't yet been picked up. But anyway, I got to cast the two guys that you see here, which is Buck Taylor, who was and a lot of Westerns, he was in Gettysburg and Tombstone and Gods and Generals and many, many years ago in Gunsmoke for about nine years. And then Rance Howard on the right, who is Ron Howard's father. And Rance was a much more interesting story. Rance has passed away. Uh, Rance had Kansas connections. He actually grew up on a farm near Dexter, Kansas. Wonderful, wonderful guy. Very nice guy. You, you can't hardly imagine it. And I was lucky enough to go to several screenings and premieres with those guys. And, and I got to go to L.A. with Rance once, which was exciting, of course. Those experiences were cool, not just for the sake of being around those people, but both these men loved history very much. And you could talk to them about it all the time. And they, they obviously, they picked their roles uh, oftentimes based on that. So I'll come back and tell at least a story or two about Buck later on, because uh, Buck has made a very conscious effort to be in stories that are related to history. When you get, sometimes when you get to a place, you have that option as an actor, as a talent. So that this is, that's just, uh, that's the film. What I wanna to talk to you a little bit about is how we select a historical topic. And that's gonna get us kind of into how films are set up. So again, I'm, I'm not saying that I had any success, but one of the things that happens is you start thinking, well, there's 100,000 things you could pick from in the pantheon of history to film, to write. How, what do you pick? And mine varied. I would say in my first couple films, it was absolutely what I was interested in. When I got to this point, I started realizing I'm going to have to do films that I can get some backing, some fun, some funding, um, some money, whatever else. And, and I usually work through a not-for-profit. Um, but the way that that film in particular, I'm just going to tell you this particular story, that the way that film was selected was that I had just won... I just won an award and I went to give a talk and at the talk, a man was in the audience named Eldeen Holtus. Eldeen was at the back of the room and when the talk was over, we walked out and he said, Hey buddy, I got a story for you. Now I've heard that. I've heard that a few times. And even in talk, even in teaching, you know, you hear that a lot of times people come up to you and say, I don't know why you didn't talk about Antietam or whatever. So that's, I'm, that's just a line I've heard many times. So I usually say anymore, can you either, especially if you're in a crowd, you go, can you email me? Can you tell me that way? Explain it to me a different way so we can take the time. But he immediately said, he said the right thing to me right away that caught my attention as a historian. He said, I live on the property where Home on the Range was written. I said, do you? And he said, yeah, I do. And the cabin that it, it was written in is still standing. And he goes, do you teach Kansas history? And I said, I do. And I, he goes, did you know that? And I said, I know the cabin's up there, but I don't know much more. So I was curious. So I would just tell you, his hook to me was he made me curious. Typically, they say in filmmaking, you got to make them curious early on. You know, who, who's who, what's going to happen, whatever. So from there evolved a investigation, me traveling to Smith Center, Kansas, uh, meeting some people, on and on. So that's how that happened. I realized, wait a minute, 
at the, by the way, when I first heard him say that, I thought, I know what Home on the Range is. Do other people know Home on the Range? I realized in the process of writing it and making the film, man, is that song well known? Like it blew me away. And in fact, I, I'll tell you, when, I, when the film came out, and, and by the way, Eldine Holtis' son is Mitch Holtis, the voice of the Kansas City Chiefs. So I didn't know any of that at that time, but that all evolved. When I went to one of the premieres, the first premiere, people came up to me and said things to me that just even still blew me away. For example, a guy came up to me and said, first time I heard Home on the Range was in a bar in the former Soviet Union. Another guy came up and said, did you know that we sing it across the soccer fields in Scotland? On and on and on. I could tell you 10 more stories like that and tell you. But the point was, I did not realize the legs that song has. It's our state song. But suddenly that was true. Also, it was true that musicians came out of the woodwork sending us emails saying, can we be in it? Can we contribute a verse? It was surprising. So it had all the elements of, hey, this could be kind of cool. And it could actually add to, you know, a story here. So um, I, we did that one as a docu docudrama. I, dra I dramatized it. I, I wrote it originally as a documentary and then I converted it. Um, so all that to say, whether you're talking to me or you're talking to Steven Spielberg, you're gonna have to give him a hook. And uh, that's just how it's gonna be. I'm an easy, I'm easy, an easy sell, <laughs> but those guys aren't. And, um, and it's challenging, of course. So, um, one of the talks I've given before is how do you make that transition? You write it, then you, how do you film it and all that from script to screen? And so now this is kind of where I want to at least investigate, not just for my purposes, but in general, kind of what is a screenplay? Uh, and I start kind of by saying what a screenplay is not. <laughs> uh, for one, it's not a novel. Um, it ha does have to be played out and you'll have to dramatize it. And screenplays are hard to read. Sometimes it's hard to read them and actually envision what's happening. That really is. Um, it's not a historical work. Like, like I said at the beginning, you probably can't go into the depth you want to go into. So pick and choose your spots. What's more important? And it's not a play. Um, you know, the, the, the fourth wall has to be present. You have to keep one wall away. Um, so you can't be that open in a film. Um, so that's important. Um, a film is a visual medium that dramatizes a basic storyline. It deals in pictures, images, and sounds. Man, again, one of my lessons was how impactful sound is to the process. We don't even realize it. We don't realize that walking by a refrigerator or coming in and out of a door or tripping over something, all of those have got to be connected to sound, not to mention music. <clears throat> and then, and I'm sure some of you guys have experience with this, the memory of the audience. I'd done some acting. I didn't consider myself a great actor. But when you're on stage, you can act and make an error and then be amazing and people will forget the error. Not in film. You make an error in film and it's printed. It's forever. People will be talking about, like my friend when he got up and he said, man, I'm going to have to either stop reading books or stop seeing movies. He had for, he'd remembered the three things. But you can kind of make up for it in public speaking. You can make up for that in a play, uh, but you just can't do that in film. It's the same way. And again, that's so amazing how impactful that is. Uh, you might see 90% uh, of a movie and it might, they may just nail it, but they bring in two actors that can't carry the day. Whew. I mean, it's just it's the truth. It's how it goes. Or music that doesn't equal the rest and it's dropped so hard. Um, so anyway, those all convey a structure or a storyline. And, um, and so I will just tell you, when I'm even watching now, you know, miniseries is in the last decade, right? Miniseries have really come back strong. And I know we're, we're older in here, but some of the series is that in the last decade that have been so strong, I'll tell you a few that have been really strong. One is called Breaking Bad. The challenge to those shows is that you've got to keep being good you get a couple, three bad episodes, you're going to lose your audience. And, you know, so filmmakers, they look at that stuff and they might even go back and say, hey, in season three, you really dropped off. 50 years ago, when we were younger, they would just, that's when a studio would come in and say, we're going to cut you, you know, we're going to kill the series. So those are all important parts. And if you think about it, that's not different than a book. It's not even different than my speech today, my talk today. 
I've got goals, you know, and I got to try to stay, stay up there as best I can. So again, I said this is structure. This, is, if, if you can make it through this, you've you've made it. You've made it, because <laughs> I'm giving you structure here a little bit. I apologize, um, but I'm trying to be educational. So in almost every story, I used to teach with an English professor who always used to say, you know, there's only three great stories, and they're all just retold over and over and over again. I'm not sure if you've ever heard that, but there's some truth in that. I always hated that because I always thought, man, you're limiting me. You're limiting us. You're saying every time I pick up a book, it's like another book. And I didn't like that. But in each story, you do have to create what I see, what you see up here, which is a setup, a confrontation, and some sort of a resolution, all in, in a storyline. You also have to create some plot points, you know, of some sort, um, somewhere in there as well. I don't like even looking at that when I'm writing. So I just wrote a, I wrote a 125 page script about six months ago. I got contract. I was, I was compensated. I had it's the second script that I ever was really, where somebody contacted me and said, can you do this? I spent six months researching it because I tried to base it on historical events, but I immediately went to my books because I thought, okay, this guy's actually paying me. <laughs> so I can't screw around here. I got to be good. And he has certain expectations. And so I immediately looked at that and I thought, I've got to hit my marks, right? Because he's, he's probably knows what he's looking for. And I'm saying that's tough because it kind of bogs down my creative mind a bit. Hey, I got to turn here. Man, I got to get another plot point or those kind of things. So those are the challenges that you're balancing. I told myself after about 50 pages to just write and come back later and see what I'd done. And that's what I did do. I came back later and actually we brought in four people who just like academic life, they ripped me. They basically, no joke. I had one guy who had like 117 comments. I went through every one of them. And the, the head guy told me, he said, Hey, make sure you remember it's your story. So if you don't agree with 115 of them, that's fine. We'll see what we think at the end or I will, I'll make, I'll make the final call. It's kind of what an executive producer would do. That was an interesting process. I had never done it quite like that before. So now I'm going to transition. I kind of gave you a little bit of a backstory on just the process, and I could say a lot more about the process, but I won't. Uh, I want to start talking about the real thing. And um, I imagine you all recognize the guy here on the on your le on the left, my right, Charlie Chaplin. But this is a this is a fascinating period, and I wanted you guys. I know you may know that the book that I uh, suggested was the um, kind of an early Hollywood. Uh, book about really silent actors primarily. It's kind of the pre 1930 story. Um, I suggested this book because I thought even if you don't read it now with me in the next four weeks, this is cool to read later. And they're five page, three page, seven page. Some of you may know these people's names a little, maybe not at all. But this is really the founders. But anyway, this is called My First Time in Hollywood. I think I have it on a slide here in a minute too. But I loved it. I loved it because, again, I'm a story guy. I love stories. And several of the stories in here really give you a feel for how Hollywood was founded and how it went from a town of 4,000 in, say, 1890 to the Hollywood we know now. Because it was a little tiny town in Southern California. It, so it's called My First Time in Hollywood. And um, it's edited by a woman named Beauchamp, Beauchamp, B-A-U-C-H-A-M-P, Carrie Beauchamp, my first time in Hollywood. It's, it's, it really is an anthology of stories. So I tell you that now because this is kind of the day that I'm going to talk about some of this and some of these stories. I'm going to share some of them, but a lot of them I won't. So you'll still enjoy reading it, I think especially if you have an interest in early Hollywood or early film. So, of course, there was a transition from stage to cinema. Again, I find this fascinating. There were people who were phenomenal on stage who, when they put them in front of a camera and put the camera right here, nothing, couldn't do it. Just like in 1927, there were people who were amazing in silent movies that as soon as they had sound in their voice, they weren't amazing anymore. They couldn't articulate it the same way which is fascinating. So there is a whole bit of scholarship on 
stage to cinema. You still see it today. So one of the, my colleagues, one of the guys I work with a lot is the director of theater at Newman University. His name's Mark Manette. I mean, actually, he'd be a great person to come in here and talk right now and tell you what I'm going to tell you a little bit. But Mark and I have talked a lot about this because Mark directs theater every day and he's written a lot of stage plays. And yet he's acted in movies. He acted in one of mine. He's acted in a lot of them. He's really good in front of a camera. It's rare that you see an actor. Let me back up because I don't want to criticize anybody here. It's rare that you see an actor that seamlessly can go back and forth. It's really difficult because in stage you overact and in cinema you don't overact. Now in some of the early films they did, they had to, partly because they didn't have sound. But when sound came, cameras got close. And again, I'm talking about some of the, I've mentioned to you some of these newer shows, watch just an actor's face for 10 minutes. Some of those actors are amazing. Their faces, they, they almost don't have to speak. Um, that's what film does, which is, which is a bit different. So um, they, have those, those, they have those variances. So the historical part of that is the images of life in general as photographic art. Of course, in 1830s, you have photography, which begins very crudely, of course, as you all know. Then you move to, this is my terminology, you move to essentially flip books. We all, can, we all know what flip books are because that's image, 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 and then spin. We, many of us had them when we were kids and we loved playing with them, you know? But that's image, image, image. So you don't really have a moving picture. You're just moving the picture, animated art. Um, and that was something that they were using in the 1870s all the way through about the 1890s. I'll show you a version of that in just a minute. And then you finally get to the 1880s, early 1880s, and you're experimenting with moving or changing images. And what I mean by that is you're, you're getting close. Now, a lot of people will remember certain names. They'll remember the Lumiere brothers or Thomas Edison. And again, some of you all may know this. Most of Thomas Edison's films are on the Library of Congress website. You ought to go if you haven't gone there. To, it's called the American Memory. And you can actually go to loc.gov and watch, uh, whatever, 1891, the sneeze of a guy sneezing. Um, these very shorts that he begins with. And then he moves all the way up to 1900, 1901, 1900. He actually films William McKinley's inauguration. 1901, he tries to film the, the execution of William McKinley's assassin. He tried to film it live. If he did, it would have been kind of the first like sensationalized uh, thing that was filmed. They didn't let him. They ended up filming a reenactment a short time later at the same location. But anyway, those films are actually all on loc.gov. And I think, they, I think the folder is called American Memory, if I'm not mistaken. It's been a little bit since I've looked, but I think it's called American Memory. So the 1880s and 1890s kind of sees the rise of, uh, and we'll see, we're going to see some of this stuff, but they sees the rise of Lumiere, Thomas Edison, his work, and some others. <coughs> So many people consider this to be the really the beginning, the beginning of film. Edward Moybridge, man, the guy himself is interesting. Like I could give a great historical talk for 20 minutes on Edward Moybridge because Edward Moybridge was an Englishman who came to the United States. Um, he was weird as heck. Creative people oftentimes are weird as heck. Um, seems to go hand in hand. Uh, but he was very, very strange. He got married to a woman much younger than him. The story goes, he found her with another man. He killed the guy. He was on a murder trial. He got loose. I mean, they later said it was defense or a fight, um, but he was an odd duck always all his life. And he was always doing stuff a little bit different. And he was always trying things a bit different. He'd experiment, experimented with photography early on. And by the 1870s, he's doing what some people would call animated art. In the 1880s, and again, he's not the only one, but we got some examples of what he did. In the 1880s, he's moving that to a whole new level. So this is some of the things that he will experiment with. So he took what we were talking about, you know, drawing, 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 flip book style almost, and said, I'm wondering if we can actually use something, because we have cameras, so can we use a camera? So hopefully you understand my explanation. 
Can we use a camera to shoot that art instead of flipping that art, instead of just standing? And before I forget, because I have so many thoughts that I'd, I'd love to share, no one thought, even when they were thinking about film, no one thought, hey, film would be profitable. It was more of a peculiarity, a curiosity. They didn't see the movie industry. They didn't see any of that. They didn't see the money either. At this point, they're just really, I would say these first three or four people, they're basically like scientists. They're just smart people. Anyway, so he's starting to think, is, can we put a camera on those art pieces? Because if we could, you know, that could be something special. So you're looking here at the horse in motion. So look at the 1880s explanation, or I'm sorry, the 1880s experimentation with the horse in motion. Now you're filming animated art. You start filming animated art, that's different, right? Because that looks different, and you can save it, and you can share it, and people can watch it. So the first 10, 15 years of this, they're just dealing with 20 second, 30 second, one minute animated art. They're gonna move to filming a person moving. Again, you're looking at, anim now you're still looking somewhat, now you're looking at what, photographic art, but he's doing the same thing, frames. You know, one of those eureka moments in my brain as a filmmaker was the day that I was setting, I, I'm just gonna tell you, this is the way it happened. I was lucky enough on one of my films to have a guy who was nominated for an Oscar in sound. He was 70 years old and he was sitting next to me and I was working on Final Cut Pro or Premiere Pro or something. And he said, he looked at my computer and he said, you know, nothing's changed. And I was like, man, yeah, it has. <laughs> it's changed so much. It's changed so dramatically. And he said, no, he goes, frames. You talk about frames per second. You talk about all the things that we used to talk about. And I thought, you're right. Like he was talking about, you know, your files. Well, they used to be real physical files. Your clips, they used to be real physical clips. We pulled them off the shelf and put them into the, 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 the uh, you know, the film strip we were creating. And I thought, man, you're, you're right. There, you look back, it's, there's, so there's a lot, lot common, a lot in common. And then we get to 1893. And these, this is one of the first items that was kind of uh, marketed. You could buy it. You could buy something to look at it. Um, you've heard of, you've, you've seen people who like look through some sort of a peephole to see moving something in the 1880s and 1990s. This is in that same vein, um, but they're gonna make it moving. That's really almost in the form of a record. You can see that it has a hole in the middle and you can see it's, it's called a phenakistoscope. So it's, it's this, the idea of it is this uh, is gonna spin while you look through a tube and in the tube, which of course focuses only on the side of the kind of album, you're going to see this. Now look at this and how, again, changing. And this is Moybridge. So Moybridge is, is, he's ramping the game up to about 1892, 1893. And that's when, at that point, they're starting to realize, wait a minute, what if we put things like this, this, this together and create some sort of a story. So you have people as early as 1892, 1893 saying, could we make it into a film? What would you make the film out of? By the way, there's been people who've, you know, of course, uh, reworked a lot of these old films now and they're super hard to work with because of what they're made out of. So every film that was made from about 1890 to 1927, they estimate that 75% have all been lost. The same is true, by the way, of sound recordings. Sound recordings probably even worse. Um, when I did Home on the Range, I actually had, since again, since I'm a historian, that's my first life, first job, my profession. When we were doing Home on the Range, I'm reading the accounts of the story and I realized, I don't wanna tell you the whole story, there was a lawsuit involved as to who wrote it. In fact, that's the premise of my film. Well, in the lawsuit, one of the pieces of evidence that came forward was that someone in 1905 or 1908 had recorded someone singing it. And if that was true, these people in Arizona who brought the lawsuit, who said they wrote it, couldn't have wrote it if this guy over here was singing it to someone else in 1905, 1908. So that someone he sang it to was a man named John Lomax. Some of you guys, if you know uh, 
that name, his son, Alan Lomax, was very famous for doing this, but Alan's dad, John, was pr you know prior to him. So I contacted the Library of Congress because of what I just told you earlier. And I said, hey, did John Lomax's recording still exist? And amazingly, within about two days, there, one of the archivists uh, and researchers there contacted me and he said, they do. Because now I'm like, are you serious? Could we have the original recording? Is it possible that that exists? Is it possible that I could use it in the film? And by the way, the original recording was a professor who went and recorded an African-American cook who'd been on the Chisholm Trail. He walked up to, the, to this, this cook in San Antonio, Texas, set down a machine and said, sing. And this cook sang 20 songs. And, and, and I'm going to go back for a minute, so bear with me. Um, this picture I show you here, sorry, that's, that's the story in my film of that moment. That's an Edison cylindric recording device. It, uh, it, it scratched basically an, uh, a recording on a really hard, what looks like a record. Well, anyway, guess what? He found, he found the, some of the, those recordings. He sent me uh, MP3s of those recordings. He sent me a, a, an AA, an audio file. And um, well, I listened to it. It was almost an hour long. And what I heard when I listened to it was, if it was an hour long, I listened to 55 minutes of scratching that I couldn't tell, unintelligible. I could make out one song and it was the song, Oh, Bury Me Not on the Lone Prairie. It's the only song I could make out. He took those recordings to a friend of his who transcribed all that music into a book called Cowboy Songs, published in 1910 by John Lomax. Pretty incredible story. The point was, even in my research, John Lomax was affiliated with the Library of Congress. So he was on, even on a higher end, but even his recordings had gone into disrepair one way or the other. So most of this stuff was lost. Film was lost, sound was lost. Many of it, much of it was lost by 1930 or 1940. Also, people thought it was worthless. They never thought anybody would be going back and looking at these things. So this is what we consider to be, so we're moving our way up here. And here we see what some people consider the first motion picture or the, or the, or the earliest surviving motion picture. And the, the, uh, the film guy here is Louis Le Prince. And people will call him the, the, the pioneer of the motion picture. And this scene is called the Round Hay Garden Scene. And it, this is a touched up version, by the way. I think the whole clip is three seconds or something. But that's it. You're looking at the original, the first. You can Google it. You can look at it. You can look, so also look at versions of it that have been kind of upgraded even more. But we consider this to be the first surviving film. It predates Thomas Edison's 1891 sneeze. But we're getting there. And again, what they're doing is they're capturing. The frame rate is, is like 12 per second. So here was the competition. When, when this came out, game was on because the competition was on again, kind of among the, the pioneers of, of early film. So Edison was involved, of course. I mean, Edison was no slouch. Edison's kind of gotten a bad rap in the last couple of years. I now have students coming up to me telling me that Edison was nothing. Um, I won't go into that. I don't want to talk about it. I mean, he, I know what they're talking about. He was, he could be kind of rough at times. He could be kind of a, a bully and all those things. And I, I understand that, but he also was a, was a genius in many ways. But anyway, his kinetoscope, which was a device for viewing sequential images. He also made money selling equipment for this process. He wasn't always a great money maker, but he was, he was a bit of a bully. He was in the sense that he was smart enough to know how to take ideas and they're, that they're going to have to be developed and, and delivered somehow. And then you have the Lumiere brothers who create the cinemato cinem cinematograph, which is the idea of uh, simultaneous viewing by multiple people. In other words, how are we going to project it? So we hadn't thought about that yet. You know, you can't just look in a hole. How that's going to take forever. Everybody walks up, looks in a hole. How are we going to project it? So that's what the Lumiere brothers will do. And while the Round Hay Garden scene is kind of considered the first or earliest surviving image or picture, um, the Lumieres shoot the first feature, the first true motion picture, putting it together. This is the this is their invention right here. This is their their first real machine to some extent because it served as a projector and a bit of a printer uh, an, an image capturer 
They cranked the camera. They had to figure out a film speed. By the way, these first inventors did, have, did not have a standard speed. Um, so you can see here, 12 frames per second. Um, that's part of why when we watch old silent movies, we're looking at films at a completely different speed. You can go in and change them if you can get to the original footage and make them look more right, real. Even when you watch sports clips, I'm obviously a sports junkie. How many times have you seen like Babe Ruth hit a ball out and then it looks like he's running, you know, super fast um, when he wasn't. And so we can change some of that now if you get to the original footage. Now, there was that dilemma, but could sound be added? And so they could record sound. I just told you Edison could record sound. In 1900, 1905, he's starting to record sound, but they can't put them together. That's going to happen in 1927. It, they know, they've got the, they know they've got the knowledge, but it's just difficult. It's all going to have to go on that film strip. And how does that happen? And how do you cut that? And how do you change that and all that? So the proper educational way to say this is they could not synchronize audio and video together. But the device that was invented by Edison that did capture sound was called the Edison Cylinder or Cylindric Recording Device. I won't go back to that picture, but I have one more story to tell you about that picture. So when I read, a, read that account of that device and that story I told you, John Lomax, San Antonio, recording that African-American cowboy, I was like, man, I want to have that scene in the film. I think that'd be a cool scene of this old man singing into this, this, you know, big tube here. I just thought that'd be super cool. So my friend, Oren Friesen and I, Oren helped me with the music. And Orrin and I started talking, like, let's look on eBay. Do they exist? Could you buy one? Could you find one? Could we rent one? Does uh, some antique store, architectural salvage downtown, does somebody have one we could borrow for two days? That's what we were doing. True story. We were at Prairie Pines. I'm probably not supposed to say the name of the place. We were at Prairie Pines in West Wichita. We were recording an artist. We were actually recording them sing Home on the Range. Um, I think the band was called Hot Rise. And we were recording them. We decided to record them in a building. And so we set them up and it was a pretty good sized room, not as big as this room, maybe half as big. But we decided to put them at one end, kind of near a fireplace. So they're, we're recording them. We're getting it all set up. They start playing. And while they're recording, Oren pushes me, kind of touches me. And he says, look on the fireplace. There was a machine. We looked everywhere. We couldn't find one. They had one at Prairie Pines. The guy had just had one forever. He had an original. He had not only an original, he had an original that worked. So one of the fun parts when we made the movie later on, as I said, hey, let's not wind it up too many times here. But when we film, we're going to wind it. And we do. We wind it and it works, which is incredible. I mean, just unbelievable. So um, and obviously to get to use it in the film and know it was the exact one that was used when they captured the film or captured the sound. So um, anyway, so this was the challenge. And, and finally, uh, you have the Dixon experimental film, which tries or makes the first attempt to put together some music and some visual, some sound and some visual. Yeah, there's, I did bring it back because I just wanted to see it. So that is, a, that's the machine. I've still only seen a couple. Um, and uh, you know, they're unique items. You can see even in working one, how difficult it would be to use it and how difficult it would be to retrieve the sound and play it back again. Very challenging. So this, this, is, this was an actor here uh, named Matthew Greer. And uh, so he wasn't a professional singer. He sings in our film. Um, he did a great job. But I didn't want a professional. I mean, I thought there's, the guy didn't sound amazing on the recording that I did here. So I figured he was a cowboy. And uh, so that's who we used. So he sings one verse of Home on the Range. I'm going to do this next slide, and then we'll take a break here in just a second. And, and I'll, I might ask if you have any questions uh, before we take the break. But this is a good place for us to pause. And I'll show some clips in the second half so you won't have to hear me nearly as much. So the real, trans, the real turning point in the film part was the invention of celluloid film. Because you were, you know, that's one of these interesting things about history. You're looking for a standard. I mean, it happened with the railroads. Happened with so many things. You can't use the things universally until you come up with some sort of a standard. Uh, we always hate when, you know, a government entity comes and does that. But the bottom line is for uniformity and for the ability for all of us to get to use things, sometimes it's necessary. So celluloid became the, you'd had nitrate before, nitrate film. Now you have celluloid film. 
It became the industry standard. It was strong. It was flexible. Um, it's, it's neat to go in some of these old uh, places like the Wichita Orpheum now because you can see some of the old projectors that were, showed some of those films upstairs still in the projection room. Um, 35 millimeters wide uh, and using four sprocket holes on each frame, this became the common, I mean the common way. And that doomed all predecessors at that point. Basically every film kind, make, whatever, before that now was just obsolete uh, because it was going to be changed. I want to I, I want to end uh, the first half here by telling you one, one story that's not on the slides. So I want to tell you a little bit about Hollywood for a second. So you all know Hollywood's in Los Angeles. And now we have an impression of Hollywood. And I just told you I was there um, two summers, the last two summers. I was not this summer, the two previous. It's a madhouse. It's crazy. I'm a, I'm, a far, I'm a Midwesterner, so I like going there in one respect, but it's, I'm there and I think it's exciting. And about five days later, I'm ready to leave um, because I just need some wide open spaces and all that. Well, Hollywood was once, as I said a minute ago, Los Angeles was about 5,000 people in about 1890. No one would have thought it was going to be the film capital of the world. They thought the film capital of the world would be New York City. No doubt. New York City was where everything happened. By the way, Money was in the East. Money was always in the East. You, the, you, know, money, you, know, you would think of, can you even get money to Kansas City or St. Louis back in the day, 100 plus years ago? So why, did, so why Los Angeles? Well, here's a couple reasons why Los Angeles worked, which we already know now, right? Weather. The original film studios were going to film a lot outside. They had to film outside. Where else can you have 12 months of good weather? Los Angeles. It's a big reason. Second reason was at that time to buy places in downtown New York City and try to even convert them into the things that you wanted, be flexible, whatever, too, too costly. So you're going to have a handful of people who we'll talk about after break, a couple of them, <clears throat> who are going to go out to the unknown thinking, I'll just at least try this and more will come. And then they'll realize some of the things I just talked about, 12 months of good weather, things like that. Well, a fun Kansas connection to Hollywood is that, and, and this is new, by the way, this is new information to me. I did not know this. I did not know this, and I didn't put it on here either. Um, and I didn't read it in our book. Well, I did, sort of, because one of our accounts from a guy named Harold Lloyd, who was a great silent actor, who I'm going to try to show a Harold Lloyd clip in a minute. Harold Lloyd actually mentioned the guy's name, um, so he does say something about him. So there was a gentleman named Harvey Wilcox who lived in Topeka, Kansas, and Again, L.A. at that time, about 5,000 people. Harvey's wife was very ill. Uh, Harvey was married to a woman 15 or 20 years younger than him. And um, she had had a lot of health trouble, trouble. Harvey, by the way, himself had had probably polio. He was in a wheelchair. So somebody told him, you, I'm sure you've heard these stories. Somebody told him when his wife became so ill with some pulmonary issues and lung issues, hey, you should go west. Climate, et cetera, be great for you. So he went to Los Angeles purely to see if his wife could get better. They got out there. They were there about three months. He couldn't believe how good the weather was. He couldn't believe how good the scenery was. He loved it. He wasn't a film guy. But what he did, what he was, was he was a real estate guy. And he said, you mean all this land is just wide open for the picking? There were no claims. There were no problems. There were no challenges. Los Angeles was a Spanish mission town. And there was a lot of wide open areas out in the valleys. So he's a real estate guy. So he goes, hmm. And he's going to make a purchase of a bunch of that land. Meanwhile, his wife is not getting better. He comes back to Topeka. She dies. By the way, if she had lived, he'd have stayed in Topeka. She comes back. She dies in about three weeks. He remarries. He tells his second wife, when I was in L.A., incredible, beautiful, gorgeous, 12 months of summer, basically. So they decide to go out there. He goes out, he buys land. When he buys this land, he buys two developments. He asked his wife, what should we name that development? She said, Hollywood. That's where the name came from. It was a real estate development. That is also why the early sign says Hollywood land. Because that was a real estate de development started by a guy named Harvey Wilcox from Topeka, Kansas. Harvey died in 1891. But those early film people, they're really going to that subdivision known as Hollywood and buying some property, and that's how it all goes. Just kind of grew from there. So 
Anybody have any questions right now before we take our break? Because if you do, I'd be glad to, to answer them. And if not, save them up and or not, it's fine too. But we can certainly take them on in the second hour. So let's take about a 10-minute break. Thank you.
Welcome back. Well, a couple of you guys ask uh, some interesting questions, and I'll try to answer um, a couple of those from up here because it might be easier. Um, if I didn't introduce myself, <laughs> I apologize, or my name anyway. I'm Ken Spurgeon, so um, that's probably important. And uh, the other thing I, two or three of you ask is about Home on the Range, the film. Uh, you can get it. I don't have any part in that anymore, um, so I so I can't get it for you, but... Um, homeontherangecabin.com is where you should go, homeontherangecabin.com. It's owned by a foundation. So what ended up happening after the film was out was that um, well, the found there was foundations that actually supported it. In fact, the Kansas Humanities Council paid for the project, uh, part of the project. But anyway, the foundation that owns the land where the cabin's at owns the rights to the film. And I know they're selling it on there probably on by DVD and maybe streaming too. So if you do have any interest in that or the story further, or even supporting that, um, homeontherangecabin.com. Another question that was a good question was the book that I referenced. Um, so John Lomax, he wrote several uh, books of kind of collections of songs that he found. And, uh, but anyway, it's called Cowboy Songs and Other Ballads. And you can still uh, find it on paperback, apparently. I just knew of the original edition. I mean, I have a first edition, I think. Um, but anyway, there were other, uh, there were other uh, volumes that came out in the years to come. It's how a lot of music was saved. You, I'm sure you all know that, but it's how a lot of music was saved was these guys going out and recording anybody they could find singing it because a lot of that stuff had not been transcribed into sheet music. feels like there was another question that I got to ask I was going to mention. For, can you hear me better? Okay, good. Um about the early Hollywood folks for just a few minutes. Um, it wasn't like an, an automatic, it wasn't like an automatic thing that uh, once even filmmakers were there, that there was going to be success or a boom in Hollywood. It was a, it was a process. And so um, this should say, I'm a, uh, this is my mistake, by the way, the quote is there, there's America and then there's Hollywood. So take off my, my end there. I realized that when I looked at this, I somehow mistyped that. <clears throat> but actually, that quote comes from inside the book um, by Noel Coward. But we've already talked a little bit about why Hollywood. But, he, you know, again, we would maybe say today, we would look at Hollywood and say it's almost a fictional place even now. It, it is to some extent. But it's not. But the irony of that is it's, it always has been. It's always been different than any place else in the world. It has to be different than any place in the world. No other place is doing what they do. And so, um, and that's for good and bad sometimes, probably. And it always has been for good or bad, probably. And I think one of the eye-opening things when you're in Hollywood is, uh, and I don't want to tell you a bunch of Hollywood stories, because that's not our point. Um, but in the book, at least, they're talking about how the film industry landed there. But I think one of the weird things for those of us who were not in the film industry, didn't grow up around it, it's almost weird um, to realize how it was done, especially until about 30 or 40 years ago. Very rare that they went on location. You know, they didn't really go on location until the 50s, a little. And then, of course, now much more often. Some of these series now are filmed in Atlanta, Austin, Albuquerque, places like that. Um, but going on location was so rare. So I'm, I love Westerns. John Ford really was one of the first people who really said, I'm going to take my cruise and go out in the middle of nowhere. So the searchers is filmed in Monument Valley and the quiet man is filmed in Ireland. But that was so rare. Instead, what was usually happening was they were filmed in Hollywood and they just kept repurposing the same sets. And um, so, in fact, a, a fun story for me personally, I told you this a little bit earlier, was when, you, uh, when I was with uh, Rance Howard, he, he said, he, you know, I'm, a, I'm, I'm of the era, I'm of the generation. And he says, starts talking about where certain things were filmed. He's, he, like I said, he loved history. And he says, well, we filmed the Griffith show in NBC. Okay, then that means nothing to me until you're standing there. And he said, here we are in my house. NBC's right there. 
And I went, so you guys just walk down there every day? He said, every day. And he said, so did a lot of other people because Bob Hope lived over there and Dean Martin lived three blocks that way. And they just walked over. So when they recorded Johnny Carson, just walked down the street. Then you're like, wow, that's so weird because in our brains, it's something else. But you're like, it's a community. And the reason I tell you that story is because when you read the early story, it's a, still a community. It's much more of a rough community. It's much more of a rough hewn community. You know, what can you make of it and how can you create it and all those kind of things. Now it's obviously super established. Um, so I think it's also interesting because Hollywood was almost like go, go, go in here and almost like uh, America where we spent so much time becoming urban. And then one day we got so urban, we said, I got to get out. And we became suburban. You know, Hollywood's done some of that, too. It was like, come, come, come. And then at some point, 30 or so years ago, can we get out? Can we film out? Uh, can we film more wide open spaces? Whatever. So. It's a unique place was the point to all of that. And, uh, and it started as a real estate development. Here's the, the photograph. And again, the Hollywood sign is still up, but now it's Hollywood land. And at the time that Hollywood was first founded and formed, this really was very wide open. It was very rough. Nowadays, there's houses all around there. There's, you know, you go on the backside of this mountain and there's houses. I mean, it's almost, for those of us who grew up watching Westerns in the 60s and 70s and 80s, it's weird to hear that you know, all of Gunsmoke or whatever was filmed right here on the backside of these mountains or, you know, within five miles, but they were. And uh, of course, some of us in Kansas knew that when we watched our favorite show that was supposedly in Kansas and they all of a sudden there were mountains and we're like, oh, there's no mountains in Dodge City. We've been there. <laughs> okay, so all that to finally start talking about movies and uh, thanks for bearing with me on that journey. Um, I'm going to ask the question, how many of you guys know this movie? So that, that's a lot of hands. You, you all know that if I asked that in most audiences, I'd get none. <laughs> I'd get zero to, to three, right? So um, I rewatched it. I actually own it. It is one of those movies now that I'm asking how it's not banned. Um, I mean, I was almost surprised that I could buy it. I, I don't really want things banned. I'm not a, I'm not a fan. Um, so, but anyway, it's very racist, of course. And I'm going to tell you a little bit of backstory on D.W. Griffith. So if you do get the book, there's lots of people who knew D.W. Griffith who write about him. He was a legendary filmmaker. I should start at the, I should start by talking about the very good in D.W. Griffith. Let me do that first. He was the first major uh, filmmaker in American history. He really was. I mean, he was the legend. Uh, in many ways, he was the mentor that so many of these people looked up to. Um, and he had so many concepts that were new, which included, and you guys could add to this, and maybe when we ask questions, by all means, um, which included wider shots. He, nobody was thinking wider shots. They were really living in a small environment, like I told you, right? One building, one house, one street. Uh, he really envisioned battle scene. He envisioned uh, just wide, big shots, which were very difficult to do. Think how challenging... I. I think of music for a second here. Let me just think about music. And again, we're old, many of you, we're old enough that we understand this. You could not, 30, even 30 years ago, you could not record a song and you had to get the whole thing right. You all know what I mean. You couldn't miss a note, the whole thing. You missed a note on second number seven of a four-minute song. You had to go back and do it again. You know, nowadays, of course, we have the ability in film and music and other things to piece things together and uh, and make it look seamless. They didn't have that. Film was the same way. When they shot a scene, man, they had to get it all right. Uh, you know, it was so difficult to do. So anyway, he kind of revolutionized the wide shot. He revolutionized large action. He revolutionized uh, layered, kind of layered shots in many ways. And, and he tried to bring history to movies. So he, you can't talk about history in film and not talk about D.W. Griffith. He is huge. This film was huge. This film was premiered um, and it, it premiered or screened at the White House, Woodrow Wilson. This was not some backwards, nobody saw it movie. Now, guess what? It was banned in one state, Kansas. Now, there were some showings, but Kansas went after it. William Allen White didn't like it. It was a, it was a glorification of the Klan. It was absolutely a glorification of the Klan. And it was pretty much, no, it wasn't pretty much, it was 
very much anti, anti-black, very much. So, and today, like I said, today, I don't know how long most of us could even sit and watch, watch it. You know, I, I rewatched the whole thing about two weeks ago, mostly because I told myself I needed to, because I wanted to make sure I had in my head some of the imagery that I, you know, if, if you asked me or just that I wanted to know. Yeah, question. She, she asked if this is an original poster. I believe so. There were multiple, there were more than, there was more than one. But by the way, uh, we're going to see a clip in a minute. The, when they show things like Lincoln, or I'm going to give you the storyline in a second, but when they show like Lincoln or Appomattox, they show the surrendered Appomattox. It's incredible. The guy really looks like Lee. The guy really looks like Grant. The detail is fantastic. Grant had on his staff an Indian, a Native American named Eli Parker, who was full-blooded Seneca. Did you know that the, the, sur- the surrender documents were basically composed by a Native American? Most people just blow Eli Parker off. D.W. Griffith has a Native American standing right by Grant. He nails the image very well. Like it kind of blows you, blows you away. I thought, man, there was no movie from another 80 years that got that scene right. So his imagery was, you know, inside the camera was really good. It's his perspective and his racism and some other things that are challenging. I wanted to say this other part real quick. So his father was a Confederate soldier and his father was in the Ku Klux Klan. He had family members that were leaders in the Ku Klux Klan and even a, a grand wizard of the Klan. So he liked the Klan. Um, he based it on a book called The Klansman, which I think that it does say that on that poster, um, which was written by a guy from South Carolina. It was a very radical book. The Klan had a great rise in 1915. If you didn't know that, the Klan looked or tried to look mainstream. They did. They made an attempt. They were on college campuses. They had, a, they had Klansmen who were a fraternity at KU. They were mainstream. Now, you'll have people who say all the time, I don't think my ancestor knew. That's a great question. <laughs> Because I do know by day, the Klan did all the marketing they could do to go out and hand, you know, take food to the poor. They, they played a great game. I, I totally get that. I have no idea what your ancestor thought. I have no idea what your ancestor thought. Or mine, if mine, if mine I haven't found any of mine that were in it yet. But, uh, but I do know this, the organization was terrible. And the organization was really doing well. There's a couple of theories why 1915 was a rise in the Klan. Uh, one theory is, and I think it's true, you have a tremendous amount of immigration in that era. It's really rising. The, na- the nation, we're becoming very international. You know, World War I is coming. There's a lot of, of that going on. You have had a lot of people protesting about the country. People that, like, like uh, Leon Zagos, who killed William McKinley, basically, you know, yells, I'm an anarchist. I mean, there, there's people who are yelling out loud, down with America. You know, we live in the same time right now, maybe. And that's a challenge. And so it gave rise to, I'm not saying it's right, I'm not saying any of it's right. It gave rise to kind of a white supremacist, nationalist, very pro-nationalist, keep out the, you know, keep out the foreigners. It gave rise to that. So it hit a lot of chords because this movie comes out one year into World War I. Now we're not in it yet. You know, we don't join until 1917. We really have to be dragged in. Wilson's trying to stay out of war. He's, pro- he's pledging neutrality no matter what. Um, okay, look, real quick about the summary of the film because I want to show the clip. So the summary of the film is that the Civil War happened. It was terrible. And um, they, they are unfavorable to Lincoln, but they're more favorable to him than many other Northerners. Uh, Although several times when he writes, you know, an order or whatever else, they say the only president to ever send military troops to, you know, attack or kill his own people. I mean, they, there's a lot of subliminals on Lincoln, but it's like you can see he's almost trying to circumvent that. And for example, for example, when Lincoln's assassinated and he shows it, see the poster? He actually shows Lincoln being shot. And there is a, there is a kind of a mourning moment, like where you feel sorry, oh my gosh, the president's been killed. But then... What he really attacks is Reconstruction. So the war, is, the war stunk, but let's attack Reconstruction because Reconstruction is the 12 more years that federal troops are in the South making sure blacks have rights, blacks can vote, 15th Amendment, on and on and on. 
civil rights, really, beginning of civil rights. That's what Griffith really puts it on. And that's when, pardon my language here, that's when the whole nation went to hell. Because you gave blacks rights. You let them run. And, of course, now his history becomes completely terrible. Here's the history and film moment. His history becomes that at that point, you had African-Americans in uniform running around, basically raiding white Southerners, you know, pulling them out of their houses, putting them in jail, beating them up, bullying them, taking them out of their jobs, almost like a reverse Holocaust or, if you know the story of World War II, a reverse Kristallnacht where the, the, they're chasing the Jews down on the streets of Europe. I mean, almost that kind of scenario. And then he also creates and brings about this, and this is somewhat subliminal, but you can't miss it. There's the bad guys are always led by a family of mulattoes, mixed race people. He's clearly telling you, in fact, he says it, maybe in the clip even we'll see how, oh my God, interracial marriage is going to go crazy. Look out. The world's going to hell in a handbasket. In fact, one of the most shocking and irritating parts of the movie is this woman who's a mulatto woman who every time there's a meeting like next door, she's like in the, the, you know, the room, room next door listening and when she hears something happen good for the African-Americans, she like throws a fit and goes, gets so excited and da, 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 da. And one of, I'm just being honest. One of my friends said he characterizes African-Americans as subhuman ape style. Yeah, he, absolutely. So you're thinking to yourself, people watch this. People saw this. The president of the United States said it was a good movie. It's, it's kind of a gut check on all of us. Okay. I want to watch this and we'll, I'll say a few more words after about, after this about the movie. So there's that. 
I think you got the you got the gist of it. It was hard to have one clip that can I close this tat? It was hard to have one clip that kind of depicted um, the weirdness of the whole thing. But uh, that was one of them for sure. Yeah, three hours long. Um, sorry, hang on just a second here. Three hours long. And uh, having said that, every... <laughs> See, we're going to go somewhere fun next. You can see we're going to go somewhere fun next because I had to have something lighthearted after that. It says I've paused. Um, so, yeah. going to get this. So anyway, it said, uh, like I said, three hours long. Most people tell you as bad as it is in that way we just saw um, that it was a, a masterpiece in many other ways. And, and it was. And Griffith became the star. And Griffith now is going to make lots and lots of movies over the next uh, 20 or so years. Everybody's going to want to be in his shows because you can make a lot of money. He's going to give birth to, um, when you, especially if you read your book, Lillian Gish, Dorothy Gish, Mary Pickford, uh, countless other famous early stars are going to want to be in a Griffith film. They can make the most money. <clears throat> they can get the most attention, all of that. Um, so Griffith is a big, big deal. Any, any questions about that? I, I don't want to just leave it, but I also don't want to belabor it. Um, it's one of those landmark movies that you need to know about. And if you study film, you're supposed to know about. And, you know, here we are 105 years later. Um, and as I said, Kansas attempted to ban it. We, I think it was shown a time or two before it got banned, but William Allen White became a crusader against the Klan. I mean, so much of a crusader that in 1932 or so, he runs for governor, said he didn't want to, said he had no interest in politics, um, but he, was, he wanted someone to publicly denounce the Ku Klux Klan. And he said, if nobody else will, I will. And so he was, you know, he put himself out there. There's a lot to, lot to admire and respect about William Allen White. Well, I, wanted to I don't have a slide for it, but I wanted to show you the alternative to that. So you were either, at this point, you're either in a kind of epic film directed by a D.W. Griffith or a D.W. Griffith protege, or you're going to be in something lighthearted. The lighthearted begins. Of course, this is going to lead us to Chaplin, Hal Roach, The Little Rascals, all of that. Shorts, <clears throat> you know, what people call shorts, which, oh, five to 20 minute type productions. So I wanted to tell you about a guy that we don't hear about so much. I'm going to tell you a little bit about him. We'll see a, a very short clip from him. And his name was Harold Lloyd. And I'm kind of a Harold Lloyd fan. You know, all these people who love films have certain people they just really admire and love. I love Harold Lloyd. And there is a short <clears throat> story from Harold Lloyd about early Hollywood in the book as well. Harold Lloyd was born and, born and grew up in Burchard, Nebraska. His family was, and now that would be just across the line and um, near Red Cloud, if you know where that's at, not too far, maybe 20, 30 miles from Red Cloud, where Willa Cather was from. His he went out with his, uh, his dad in particular and some other family members about 1905 or so. He was a talented actor. He realized that what the early industry needed was something different. He was trying to create the something different. He says in, in the book, he says, Time and time again, I tried for regular roles. I tried to be the leading man. He tried for all these other things. He couldn't quite land or stick. Finally, um, a couple things happened to him. By the way, I think in real life, he's a pretty handsome guy. But he realizes that he needs to create characters worthy of people watching more than once. So an event occurred. Uh, before I say that event, um, he was... Many people consider him to be the first famous stuntman. I feel bad if I don't talk, mention Buster Keaton's name because Buster Keaton was the man, you know? So I'm not, I love Buster Keaton. Don't, don't think I'm saying he wasn't. Keaton was as reckless and crazy as anybody. <clears throat> but Lloyd realized I need to do, I need, a, I need an edge. I need something different. Um, 
I think in those days, in many ways, being an actor in Hollywood was almost like a small business. Create your brand, you know. I think that's true. I think that was true for a long time. So in 1918, Lloyd was on a movie set, and they were messing around with fake explosives, quote unquote, fake explosives. And Lloyd had in his hand, I forget if it was a stick of dynamite or something like that. And he's acting like he's lighting it. It wasn't fake. It blew up and it blew off his thumb. I know his index finger and maybe another one. He thought, my, my career's over. He was a stunt man. Half of his gig was the ability to grab, hold, swing, <laughs> punch, whatever. And he just got a terribly messed up hand. He had a doctor in Hollywood build him a prosthetic hand. Now, again, what's cool about this is I, he's like, I got to be able to use it. But he also realized the beauty of that was, guess what else? If I got a fake hand, you could hit that hand really hard. So when he comes back in the industry six months, a year later, he starts thinking of ways to use that hand in a way to, because it looks like a real hand. He's got a, a, a human looking prosthetic hand. Anyway, so that was number one. I could still be a stuntman, but now you can really hit my hand or I can hit something that looks like I sh shouldn't be able to hit it. The second thing he figured out was his was glasses. <laughs> he started wearing glasses. They were totally props. He want, and this is what he said. He was from Burchard, Nebraska, and he said, I wanted to be an everyman. I didn't want to look like a matinee, model, matinee idol. I, you know, There were those guys out there. Valentino was coming up, Rudolph Valentino. There were guys who were good-looking guys. I needed something different. Plus, stunts, comedy, trickery, that was his thing. So that's what he made his name doing for the next 10 years. But here's the next thing about Lloyd. And again, as a Midwesterner, I'd love to tell you that this is what, what the Midwesterner and him. All these other actors, like 95% of these other actors were going and getting gigs. They were going and getting work. Harold Lloyd said, I'm going to go get work, but I'm going to own the production or at least part of it. So Harold Lloyd is your first, other than a Griffith, he's your first silent star who becomes a millionaire. And he builds an estate called Green Acres. And I'm going to forget his wife's name, maybe Mildred Davis, but don't quote me. I haven't thought about that for a long time, but she was a famous silent actress as well. So anyway, he was in several films in the 20s. Uh, the most famous one is called Safety Last. And we're going to watch a little clip from Safety Last. Now, he doesn't do all the crazy things you see him doing, but listen to this. And again, this is where younger audiences would like this too. There's no CGI in 1915, 1920, 1925. You can't fake anything. If you're like Buster Keaton and you see a wall come down and you, the doorway only clears you, that's for real. <laughs> You jump on and off a car or train, that's real. And you may have one try, one try at it too. Set, you set something on fire, run from a fire, run through a fire. And Lloyd did this kind of stuff. Now this safety last scene we're going to see, he's hanging on the side of a building. It was dangerous. It was very dangerous. Wasn't quite as dangerous as it looks. Um, because what they do is they're going to shoot at an angle to where it looks like he's higher than he is. But that was a challenge too. If you If you know even later on, I won't be talking about it in here, but if you know, even later on in the Wizard of Oz, they basically pulled off a few, 23, pretty incredible. So let's watch a little moment here with Harold Lloyd. Um, I'm a little bit delayed here. <laughs>
film about him, but um, I actually, I'm going to pause it there on purpose here. So this was the scene everybody remembered when this was over. They remembered this clock tower scene or this clock scene where he hangs off the clock. So he was famous for hanging off things, going up to crazy heights, very dangerous. It's, again, it's not as far as that you see there, but he and several of his films went up and hung on to certain things. Now, think about the story I just told you. How much more scary is that when he has one hand? As one of those hands isn't his. I mean, it's not workable. He doesn't have opposables. So, um, so anyway, he was a crazy guy for sure. But he made a ton of money, and he knew how to entertain audiences, and you saw his look and all that. So Harold Lloyd, he lived until 1971. In fact, one of the interesting things of some of these early actors is Lloyd lives until the 70s. Lillian Gish, who was with D.W. Griffith, is in Birth of a Nation, lives until 1993. She lived to be almost 100. So you could talk to people who were in these movies until, you know, 20 some, 30 years ago. Okay, well, let me move forward here. So 19, we, we say 1927 is the advent of talkies. First film with a synchronized soundtrack. 2020 has been the year of uh, synchronous, asynchronous phraseology constantly among educators. You know, we constantly are saying, is it a synch synchronous class? Is, you know, whatever. Is it a recorded class? 1927 was the first time they could put an, a sound line on a film clip, on a film strip. And... Um, and this is one of the earliest of those films, uh, Don Juan starring John Barrymore. The Barrymore family was, of course, a famous family. A lot of these movies were at least allegedly historical in nature. I'm obviously not talking about them. I'm going to end today with the most, what I think consider to be the first famous historical movie. And you know, by the way, uh, I am going to talk about other movies in the weeks to come. And not every one of those movies is based specifically on a historic event. Um, but I have a reason for some of the ones I'm going to talk about. I, it gives me a chance to talk about certain things in the era, in that era. Um, so, but many of them were based on, on actual events or actual things that have had occurred. So, um, how many of you guys have seen this movie? And how many of you have read the book? Yeah, so I love this book. I, I mean, this is one of my very favorite books. If you've never read All Quiet on the Western Front, man, read the book. In fact, read the book before the movie. You know, I had that line earlier where my buddy said, you know, I'm going to read books or I'm going to watch movies. I do both. So whatever that makes me, I don't know. But I love both. I, I'm obviously an avid reader. Um, I mean, I think All Quiet on the Western Front is one of the five greatest books ever written. Uh, and I also think it's the greatest war novel. And I also think it's the greatest anti-war novel. And it sometimes is described as both because it has that impact. It gives you war at a level that is just unbelievable up till that time. And yet it gives you, a, you know, your heart is constantly going, what, what are we doing here? Why are we doing it? And um, so anyway, when I used, to, I used to teach a class for many years called Great Books, which was a bit of a hybrid between English and history. And we always read All Quiet on the Western Front. I made the kids, re, uh, you know, read it. And the funny thing is this movie's been remade, I don't know, seven times. I still like this version the best. And I don't say that about very many movies. I don't, I, as much as I love old movies, you know, I usually like the newer version. I mean, I saw True Grit of eight or 10 years ago and I'm a John Wayne fan. And I was like, the movie's better. John Wayne might, I'd love to have seen John Wayne in that cast instead of Jeff Bridges, maybe. I think it'd have been fine. But I had to admit the movie was shot beautifully, you know, and just so many elements of it that I loved. So anyway, this, let me give you a little bit about this. And then we're going to watch a couple of these clips. So, um, or at least one of these clips. So the author's name is Eric Remark, and Eric Remark was a veteran of World War I. He was a, a German veteran, which is interesting. This is told from the perspective of a German soldier. Of course, everybody hated Germany, even then. I mean, everybody outside of Germany did. They thought Germany had started the war. The Treaty of Versailles and the Treaty of Brest-Lavosk had, 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 had uh, pushed down some pretty hard reparations on Germany for being the bully that started World War I. It's going to have a lot to do with why Germany has an, an axe to grind when we get to World War II. Um, but Remark was a wounded German veteran, and he gives us an insider's view of the, of, the, of the war. I mean, he really gives us an insider's view. He creates very real characters. It's easy to say, at least until recently, 
This is arguably the best historical movie. Now, he says it's a, he says he took his real experiences and created, you know, kind of fictitious characters, but it's clear that it's a very real story because of the way he wrote it. I should tell you a couple of things real quick about World War I and history. Uh, Hemingway, of course, wrote, other people wrote about World War I. Hemingway had been there. Hemingway got mad at some other authors that wrote about the war who hadn't been there. He thought, they, you wouldn't know. Uh, most notably, uh, Willa Cather, who I mentioned, if you don't know Willa Cather, uh, My Antonia, um, O Pioneers. She's from Red Cloud, Nebraska. She wrote a book called One of Ours that won the Pulitzer in 1922, 23 maybe. One of Ours, I think it's called. Uh, Hemingway just ripped her. He basically said, what would a woman know about war? What would a woman know about writing about, about a war? You have no idea. So uh, that's another story, except what, I, what I'm getting at is, I will say this, Remark had an interior, an interior view of the war and, and people that was just incredible. So the first time I read it, I was blown away. And I read it, I think, the first time in high school and then you'd read it again like 15 years later and just loved it. So we're going to see a couple of clips from it. But to also think this is two years into talkies. So and wins the Academy Award 1930. Um, I, I could tell you a lot more about the movie, movie, but I won't now. I may say a little bit more about it uh, later or next week even. But let me try to show you a clip. I use this particular site for this part because you can see several clips from the movie. This is actually kind of one of these discussion uh, um, sites that goes into several uh, kind of movie reviews and critiques and, and whatever. Um, I want to show you, I'd like to actually show you uh, two, I think. They're both two minutes long, so they won't take us long to show. Uh, the French certainly deserve to be punished for starting this war. Everybody says it's somebody else. Well, how do they start a war? Well, one country offends another. How could one country offend another? You mean there's a mountain over in Germany gets mad at a field over in France? <laughs> well, stupid. One people offends another. Oh, that's it. I shouldn't be here at all. I don't feel offended. It don't apply to tramps like you. Good. Then I can be going home right away. Uh, yeah, you just try yeah, it. Yeah. You want to get shot? The Kaiser and me. <laughs> me and the Kaiser felt just alike about this war. We didn't either of us want any war, so I'm going home. He's there already. Somebody must have wanted it. Maybe it was the English. No, I don't want to shoot any Englishman. I never saw one till I came up here. And I suppose most of them never saw a German till they came up here. Oh, I'm sure they weren't asked about it. Well, it must be doing somebody some good. Not me and the Kaiser. I think maybe the Kaiser wanted a war. You leave us out of this. I don't see that. The Kaiser's got everything he needs. Well, they never had a war before. Every full-grown emperor needs one war to make them famous. Why, that's history. Yeah, generals, too. Sure. They, they need more. Manu manufacturers, they get rich. Mm -hmm. I think it's more a kind of fever. Nobody wants it in particular, and then all at once, here it is. We didn't want it. The English didn't want it. And here we are, fighting. I'll tell you how it should all be done. Whenever there's a big war coming on, you should rope off a big field and, and sell tickets. Yeah. And 
And on the big day, you should take all the kings and their cabinets and their generals, put them in the center, dressed in their underpants, and let them fight it out with clubs. The best country wins. Ah, right. uh, the French certainly deserve to be punished for starting this war. Everybody says it's some. The funny thing about that clip is that when my students read that in that in the book, which is a great clip, you know, these, this guy says basically, "Why are we all fighting their fight? Why are we fighting their fight? How about they come and fight their fight?" And uh, when my students would read that, they always thought that was the most unique way of telling that story, of telling the story of how how nations get into fights. I want to show you one other one where the main character, Paul Bomber, has uh, encountered his fir the first man that he, that he may have killed. Away. That's why you accused me. I tell you, I didn't want to kill you. I tried to keep you alive. If you jumped in here again, I wouldn't do it. You see, when you jumped in here, you were my enemy. And I was afraid of you. But you're just a man like me, and I killed you. Forgive me, comrade. Say that for me. Say you forgive me. Oh, no, you're dead. Well, you're better off than I am. You're through. They can't do any more to you now. Oh, God, why did they do this to us? We only wanted to live, you and I. Why should they send us out to fight each other? If we threw away these rifles and these uniforms, you could be my brother, just like Cat and Albert. You'll have to forgive me, comrade. I'll do all I can. I'll write to your parents. I'll write to... to your wife. I'll write to her. I promise she'll not want for anything. And I'll help her and your parents too. Only forgive me. Forgive me. Forgive me. Forgive me. <laughs> what I find interesting about what I find interesting about All Quiet on the Western Front, it's an incredible story. But what I find interesting about it is how much more realistic it feels and, and plays than Birth of a Nation 15 years earlier. You can see the changes coming. Uh, the sound, we just talked about that, right? Now, made it, we'd all say it's not the sound like we know now, but you could hear all the sound all through the movie. You can hear different sounds. You can hear water running. You can hear when someone's shot once, you can hear blood rolling. You can, I mean, it's very graphic compared to in, you know, anything up to that point in time and a talkie. And, and, and of course, you're inside the characters, much more so. I didn't say this about the Griffith film, about Birth of a Nation. He's interesting because most of that film, you don't even have the silent actors like lines. He, he gives you more like bold statements as opposed to like dialogue. 
most silence after that. They, you, you know, you get some dialogue, at least in print. Um, so that's kind of an evolution that's occurring too. But by 1930, uh, it's, it's a, what a change. The other thing about All Quiet on the Western Front, of course, it won the Academy Award. But what else is unique about All Quiet on the Western Front is it had more than national appeal. This book was banned by Adolf Hitler. I bet you don't think that's a surprise, right? He didn't want anybody going through those kind of thoughts. <laughs> like, what is, why war? Any of that stuff. So it was banned. Um, and the movie was, of course, banned. They didn't, there were lots of countries that wouldn't show the movie. So, but that movie's had, like I said, what an incredible run and staying power it's had all this time. And again, my test as a teacher was that I would show a 1930 movie to 16-year-olds and they loved it. You just get them quieted down and say, we're going to watch this movie. And they definitely want to see what happened next. They loved the movie. It, it, it affected them and impacted them. So one of the rare movies that the book and the movie both great and both have a direct impact. If you guys have any questions, I'm going to pause. And uh, like I said, in the, in the weeks to come, I'm going to talk more about specific movies, usually about three at a time. And we'll see more clips, maybe we'll see a little bit more of movies too. But um, do you have any specific questions that, um, that I can answer? Yeah. Okay, I'm not hearing you. I apologize. Try one more time. Yes, yeah, so you can come up to this microphone too if you'd like. But if you say it louder, I'll repeat it. That's a good question. So she's asked if Warner Brothers was one of the original or early production companies. They were. I don't know. I can't remember if that is originally produced by the Warner by Jack Warner, but they are early. They are very early into the into the game. Yeah. You guys know this. I hope I'm not insulting you at all. You know this. One of the things I say when I teach some of these classes is that our students and our the younger people. They don't understand that when we saw a TV show or a movie, we saw it one time. In my house, I was the youngest of five, four boys. And uh, man, when a TV show came on or a movie came on, like a Western, the, you could hear a pin drop in the house because you weren't going to miss a line. You know, it, it, we were intent on watching it. We couldn't rewind. We couldn't go back. And so uh, and the same for the theater, of course. And of course, we still stay. Hey, stay, stay quiet in the theater. But um it gave us attention. It gave us focus. We knew that we had one crack to watch it um, and all that. I remember as a kid even watching a movie one time, and it was a movie that was uh, from the early 1950s, and I for years couldn't remember the movie, but I always thought, I remember an image or something from that movie. So, And you know how many people would do that, and people would talk about that. There were many people who saw these kind of movies in the theater in 1930, and they never saw it again. You have people who are writing in the 1950s and 1960s and asking television stations, would you please find that movie and show it again? I remember seeing it when I was, you know, 18 in 1930. I just think that's a part that we've kind of, we've missed. We just, of course, it's like books. We have such a luxury to get them when we want and whatever. Anyway, uh, any, any other questions, Tad? Any other from abroad? Thank you guys very much for your attention. I'm going to imagine you smiled the whole time. And I do hope you'll come back and I'll see you in, next week. We did talk about that, and I'll try to even bring it and even give it as a handout. Because I, yeah, and I don't know, I, my challenge is knowing how many to include, uh, but I might try to get to a 10 or a 20 or something, squeeze it.